now get uh, Monty Mikael Videnius to present about um, optimizer changes in uh, MariaDB 11. And just to set the stage and steal a bit of thunder from Monty, he says that from uh, <laughs> 100 queries, he would probably uh, be affected uh, in, in uh, 10 out of the cases you would, you would get a better result or, or a different result. But I will leave again the audience with a cliffhanger. Monty, please. <laughs> so, despite Kai's try to steal the thunder, we will continue. So this is a, a, a talk about what I've been doing during basically the last uh, year. And uh, so here is a short overview of the, uh, my talk. And uh, I will not try to uh, say what's on the slides. I will try to uh, talk around those. So uh, you can read them now. You can get a look at the slides later uh, through YouTube. and. Uh, if you look at the presentation later, you even will have subtitles, which make my English a little bit easier to understand. So, starting with the background. So, uh, in September last year, I decided that uh, uh, we have some issues with selectivity that needs to be f uh, fixed. Uh, uh, our optimizer team needed more resources, and I thought that uh, I wrote the uh, initial one, so some things is uh, can be blamed on me, so let's try to get this done. And I actually hadn't looked at the selectivity code, so let's try to fix it. So uh, the issue was that sometimes the selectivity was that the uh, optimizer created was bigger than zero, which basically means that you can trust it, you get wrong results, and. But while fixing it, I noticed that there's a lots of things in the optimizer that has been changed over the years. M lots of good things done here and here and here, but uh, the integration of those left something to be desired, and it was time to fix it. And uh, almost one year uh, later, I noticed that uh, no, most of the bugs are fixed but uh, I still can't get the cost to work, so to get the optimizer to choose the right plan, so something has to be done. So I had changed all the costs to be in milliseconds instead of basically approximate over I.O. And that has helped me tremendously of getting things to a complete, and basically the, the, this task is com was completed yesterday. And it's, uh, it's about 60 commits, some very big ones, and uh, everything is available and hopefully will be in uh, MariaDB 11 uh, zero sometimes uh, next week, but more about later. So the intention of the optimizer, and especially this change, is to find the best table combination and best access plan. Table combinations that if you have three, table, three or four tables, in which order should the join uh, be done. Uh, I also worked on replacing lots of cost-based rules, uh, sorry, uh, logical rules to be cost-based. Um, uh, there's also options for end users to know tuned optimizer cost if something would be uh, wrong related to the hardware they are using. For example, if they're using a, a memory file system, then costs are totally different compared to hard disk one, and so on. Uh, all costs in the when you do a last square result or you can optimize a trace, I know in microseconds. So it's very easy to see that does the optimizer know what it's doing? You do a query, and the query time should be roughly uh, the, the cost. Uh, MariaDB trace was added by Petrunia in uh, 10.4, and without this tool, I couldn't have done this. So I'm really grateful that we uh, had this one. I was a little bit unsure that when he started, that how useful, useful could this be, and I'm happy to see that it's uh, 
probably one of the best tools for developers to work on the optimizer and, and see what is going on. And as part of this project, I added a lot of more information to the trace to be able to see uh, the query cost and the planning in detail. Mm. So uh, the, uh, now I will go through basically all the major uh, commits that is uh, in, in the new tree. The first one was what I started was what, uh, with was that if you use condition selectivity form, which means that uh, try to use all selectivity information you have from, from histograms and, uh, and other sources like uh, um, like you get from analyze. Uh, in some cases, selectivity becomes uh, bigger than one, and the plans are suddenly really, really bad because the optimizer actually thinks that we will get more results from a table than there is still rows in the table. And if you're using something less than 11 zero, and you have an issue with the bad plans, you should set condition selectivity to one, and that goes back how things was in 10.5. As, as far as I know, all calculations are fixed. Uh, they are searched to, to ensure that it never becomes uh, bigger than one. I have done extensive uh, checks of all uh, queries that has changed in this uh, uh, new optimizer trees, and there is thousands of queries that has changed. Not much, but still some costs, some ro rows, and so and everything looks really, really good. But as part of this change, I also did a major uh, benefit for the optimizers that when we go through a table and find all, go through all the indexes and try to see which index to use. Um, sometimes we are using filtering, sometimes not. But we know we remember the smallest number of rows that we see to any combination. For example, there's a filter that is very selective but also takes a very long time to execute. But that still tells us that in this WHERE clause, there only will be 10 rows. We would use that. We didn't use that before. And that allows the optimizer know to do much better decisions than ever before. So that was an insight while working with this that actually helps a lot. Some other uh, optimizations that are uh, useful is that I noticed that uh, uh, when do, we do derived tables as part of a subquery, uh, we are creating a key for um, be able to use the, the temporary table efficient. But it's, uh, for example, here is where A in select. Uh, it's much better to create a unique key than a normal key for the subquery, which we didn't do. No, we do that, and that means that all plans are changing who are using this. Uh, the right table from using a ref, which means that go and try to find all rows with this number to EQ ref, which actually makes things uh, both faster and easier to understand. So the cost calculations for most things has changed to be in smaller parts. So instead of just trying to assume that reading one row, that's one discrete, reading one key, that's one discrete, doing some access of the where clause, that's a fifth of a discrete. So when we had no searching uh, or accessing cost through time, it's, it was harder to get the cost correct, but it's much easier to verify those and actually get something that, uh, that is close to reality. So the consequence of the cost collisions is that we are much more likely to use an index, uh, we are going to use filters more, Materializations will happen less because the cost is actually higher than we expected it to be. There are also costs in index for group by, which is uh, something we can do for group by optimizations. Uh, but the one of the uh, big changes is that uh, before we assumed that the disk access cost was on a hard disk. Most people don't, don't run productions with hard disk anymore. So all cost calculations in the survey is now based on uh, the the speed of SSD. You can actually change that, it, uh, just change the one variable, but about that later. And we also have to assume that all rows, the read rows are cached, because uh, 
I thought I was ready with the optimizer three weeks ago. And then I uh, started to do some testing for some performance queries. I noticed that the cost uh, calculation didn't match reality at all. And if you imagine that uh, you have one table that has one million rows, and then we're doing, going to read, do a read in a table that has one row. We're not going to do one million disk accesses for the, for the table with one row, because that will be cached. But that's what the optimizer thought. So that's no fixed. And, and we started to get sensible queries for that. So uh, internally, what, what has happened is that instead of having just one row access, one cost, is that we have, I have split uh, the cost into uh, what is, 12 different variables, uh, where the discrete cost is the high one. And, uh, and then you have for reading a key or copying a block or copying a key or copying a row, each of the different costs. Uh, I, there's a program that's a part of the server uh, who allows you to, to check the cost and all the cost calculations and how I come to these numbers is in docs optimize the cost. So all the calculations is clearly explained how we come to this. I know the SQL level, uh, so this every engine has their own costs and, and, if, uh, and you can change anything of those. And then you have some SQL level cost that, for, uh, that you can then also affect things. So, uh, so these are the user levels and this is per engine. So these are basically global, these are local. And uh, here is a ex an example of uh, running check cost where we check that does the area engine, does the cost match actually the expectations. So it does uh, some, you can run 10 different tests, t starting with table scan, then key lookup, index scan, everything else. And uh, the first row shows what happened when for table scan, and then you can see the results at the end. And as uh, you can see, all the costs uh, divided by time, they are very close to one, which means that the optimizer was able to figure out exactly uh, the, uh, the time of the query. And this is run with a table with uh, one million rows, and you do that for all engines. Because that means that for a smaller table, probably the cost calculation will be a little bit too much. But that, and trying to optimize that, we shouldn't do the mistakes with big tables. Because with small tables, if the optimizer does some mistakes, who cares? The time is, time is fast enough. But when you start to go into million rows, things start to matter. And uh, uh, we have two. Uh, slides for the technical part of the audience. Um, sorry, Kai. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that shows how things are uh, read up. So we have key read time, where basically is the uh, virtual handle that the, uh, the, uh, that storage engine can override. Uh, that should uh, tell us how many blocks are we going to use for re reading this index. And then, then we calculate that the, uh, the, the total cost is the time and range times key lookup cost, and uh, then key next find for all the rows, remaining rows. And uh, then we also add, when we do the final cost, is that we also add a key copy cost and where cost. Where cost is the, the, the time to execute the where clause. And then we have the full cost for an uh, index lookup. And for doing a row lookup, we basically do the same thing. First, try to, try to calculate the, um, the cost of uh, reading a block, and then calculate the cost of actually ac accessing the data. And this function is just to sh there to show that uh, reading a block, there's a, a, a factor of how many blocks, that's the blocks read, and then how, what's the CPU cost of doing that. Okay, so uh, as part of the project, I changed a lot of rule base to be cost cost based, and um, and here is everything that is related to this one. The goal is to remove all rule based uh, uh, 
things for the, from, the, from the server because usually those things are bad because it doesn't take into account the execution time. For example, we had rule base that uh, if it's a cluster index, we should do this. If, you, if it's a covering index, in other words, we can solve the thing with the cover index, we should do this. All these ifs are, are gone and instead we just calculate the cost of each uh, version and then compare the costs. Uh, we also had some issues with, uh, uh, or actually, the first, second one is the worst rule that we had in the optimizer. It kind of works and I think it was done for satisfying some benchmarks. Basically, uh, is that uh, if you have a key who has all elements are the same and you have one million rows, then of course, if you're going to use that key, we are going to access one million rows. But in the code, we had that if we would use more than 10% of the um, table, then we'll cap it there, which means that we will use this index uh, for doing range scans when it doesn't make any sense because table scans will be more than 10 times faster. Actually, it will be 20 times faster. And having cost base, we don't need that anymore. There was a really old bug in InnoDB that when we asked uh, uh, the InnoDB that uh, how many tables, sorry, rows is there in this range? If the range was more than 50%, it's a basic answer, it's only half of the rows. And I think that some, Marco can probably correct me, I think that's something from uh, Heike Turi's time where he didn't like some of the decisions in the optimizer in, in MySQL, and that was MySQL time, so we decided let's cap the things in InnoDB because then the optimizer will do the right thing. But now when we actually want to be, do the correct thing, to be able to say that, uh, uh, no, we have a range scan. When should we do use the index, or when should we use uh, a table scan? We need, need actually the exact, as exact numbers as possible. And we also had some problem with aggregate distinct. Uh, basically, uh, if you do a, a sum on uh, sum on distinct and value, where the, the things was rule based and didn't always work. No, they're cost-based. I did a lot of small improvements for uh, uh, the optimizer, especially in uh, with uh, uh, row ID filters, where the code was something that I didn't want to talk about in the public because I would still get upset looking at the code. It wasn't as good as it, it should be in MariaDB. We do much more caching. We, I added much more uh, code comment because uh, Lots of people worked on optimizer, and lots of things was not commented. And I was uh, spending a lot of time with Petrunia and others to understand the code and add those. We also have uh, tried to uh, use uh, longer keys when it makes sense, because in the first place, with the, the where the optimizer sometimes would do a ref on the first key part. And, and because it has the same cost as the range of everything. But the range actually has more information, so it will be used that one. I had, had to add uh, Optimus as scan setup cost that is used for table scan because uh, uh, our M MTR test suite uh, uses very, very small tables. And in the end, if I wouldn't have done that, everything would be table scan and we wouldn't be able to test anything. So the most important optimizer costs that people may want to change or know about are these. Um, so when, when assuming that we have to read a block, uh, we will take the optimizer disk read cost times the read ra ratio, and ratio will tell us what is the chance of the block, block being in the cache and using those. So uh, if one is using a hard disk, you only have to change the disk read cost to be uh, the speed of a hard disk. And you can use uh, scan setup cost to, uh, to, uh, if you want to avoid scans. Um, and all these are in, in microseconds, because uh, even if the cost internally is in uh, microseconds, is that the microseconds 
would be so small, it would be very, very hard to read. So uh, there is a factor between what we, the user uses and the server uses with a factor of 1,000. So, for example, assuming that uh, the optimizer has a wrong optimization sometimes, somewhere, and uh, produce a wrong plan, and you want to force the optimizer to use the plan that has the least amount of rows, you can just increase the wear cost that is added to each accepted rows, and then you get the smallest possible uh, access to rows, but hopefully that should be needed. Everything can be changed, uh, all the SQL level costs can, are, are session variables. Uh, if you want to change in the DB discrete cost, you can just do that. You can have those in config files. Uh, you can, uh, normally, you never had to change those. But the issue is that, assuming that uh, Wikimedia would have an issue that optimizer does something wrong in the performance testing, you can probably tell them to just uh, change one of the variables and things will be good. So if you don't have to do recompile everything else. And the formulas are pretty easy and, and, and easy to understand, so it's, I don't expect anything that is unchangeable. So the new optimizer should be uh, uh, better for most things, and I don't expect there will be uh, lots of queries that actually change uh, uh, to the worse. Hopefully always to, to be better, assuming that costs are calculated correctly. But, they can easily be changed. So the question is that do all these changes that I've been working on for one year, when does it matter to you? When should you think about using this? Is this something that should be interested for Wikimedia? And uh, looking at how the query optimizer was uh, discussed several times in the last talk, I would say that this should be highly beneficial for uh, Wikimedia. It, it, if you're just using a couple of tables, uh, small tables, uh, uh, just using join a couple of those, it, it probably will be fine. You will not see any, any difference between the old optimizer and the new, uh, new because uh, this only affects uh, when you have lots of tables or lots of data. But these are the, uh, the main things where you get a benefit. And we had the 10% that I mentioned uh, earlier. For example, you have key between 1 and 1,000 and you have 2,000 rows. That's half of the data. You should never use that key. MariaDB up to 11 will use the wrong key. So complex queries, mixing storage engines, no, the optimizer actually knows that uh, in most cases the memory engine is about three times faster on, uh, in a DB. It's 10 times faster with table scans. Uh, three times that, uh, faster on, on indexes when everything is in memory. You, don't, you probably don't need, need force index anymore because the optimizer should be able to figure it out. You can still use it. And in some cases, uh, where the histograms could make plans worse, that was because of uh, the problem with selectivity. And because that's fixed, analyst table should work good. So state of things. I finished... Uh, uh, all known things uh, yesterday, so now it's time for users to start, to start testing it. We will still do some performance testing just to verify uh, all the queries. Uh, there is a branch that is, has a very, very strange name. You, can, you don't have to remember it, but it's because things will change next week. It's, just, it's uh, still up to discussion if it will be 11 zero or not, but because this is one of the biggest changes in the optimizer and uh, in uh, almost 10 years, and I can't guarantee that everything will be better. I, I expect everything to be better. Uh, so it still needs to have a little bit of testing, and we have, I hope we can work with Wikimedia to use the infrastructure to test this. And of course, I have got lots of ideas of future things to improve in the optimizer, as I know I had time to see what happened during the last 20 years on it. So lots of things really, really good, but something still needs to be improved. And at last, uh, some thanks to Petrunia, who has been here helping me with the optimizer trace and uh, doing reviews and explain uh, to me when I haven't understand some of the new delicatess in the new code. 
and Vicenzo helped me with the cost calculation for file sort, and, and Andrew, who helped me get uh, column store uh, close to complete to work with the new things. And for storage engine writers, you basically have to add one function to your storage engine to tell about the cost. If you don't do, we will assume that uh, this is a cost that is similar to area. In other words, a normal engine that can do kilocups and doesn't have a clustered index. If you have a clustered index, you need to copy a couple of rows from you know, DB and maybe run the um, check cost program to check that are your costs correctly calculated. And there are documents to see how I calculate everything. So adding a storage engine to get proper cost is half an hour of work, hopefully. So that's that. Thank you, Monty. So now there's 15 minutes time for questions, either by you to the audience or by the audience to you. And I will start by asking this um, thunder question again. So uh, is it a fair estimate that out of 100 queries, let's say 10 will be affected because you said that most of the smaller queries won't see a change. So roughly 10 would be affected and hopefully 9 out of those 10 would be improved. Let's say this way. I think there is uh, 20,000 queries in that test suite, roughly, uh, really rough estimate. And uh, some thousand had changed, but usually it was just uh, explained because we have uh, statistics on part of it. And some of the statistics was wrong before, so that corrected. If you look at query plan changes, some couple of hundreds. And as far, I, I went through almost every single one of those, and they are better now. At least in, in, the, in the test suit, that not a single one who is worse. So then uh, it was hinted at both Monty's presentation and, and Manuel's that there is an ongoing idea for some uh, optimizer testing. So comparing two releases of uh, MariaDB with each other. So let's be, briefly say something about that idea and I'm then asking. Manuel, what you, what you think about it. So it would be a possibility to do lightweight, as, as lightweight as possible, testing of, the, uh, of a slave. So you could, in, in your cluster, add an, a, another slave, which gets the same queries as, as the, the slave that is being compared to. So you would, in that scenario that Manuel had uh, comparing 10.4 and 10.6, they would have been into the normal 10.4 cluster uh, added a 10.6 uh, node and then measurements taken in parallel on those two and without sort of having to do the same type level of fire type testing that that could have been could have been tested so that's the idea that we are pursuing we're still not announcing anything but we're pursuing an idea so so I'd like to, to hear a comment by Manuel both on on what Monty said and, and how you would go about gaining the confidence in sometimes uh, taking uh, that release into use. Yeah, talking about uh, the tool that you're describing that's probably going to help us a lot um, because it will simplify the whole process I was explaining before. And then the talk about Monty. Um, yeah, we do. I've seen some of the things that you're mentioning there. Like, for example, if you have had to use for index, force index to get a good plan, that is the case that we have in code in a bunch of places. So I, I'm, I'm very interested to see that uh, can be no remove those. Because yeah. if my cost calculations is correct, uh, then none of those will be needed. Yeah, that's why I'm interested in, in checking this out in our environment, in a control, obviously, in a yeah. control situation, um, to see how, how of the bugs that we reported with the optimizer, if they get fixed, and we can go ahead and remove yeah. uh, those uh, force index or use index that we have in code. Yeah. Thank you, Manuel. I would like to give the word to Sergei Petrunia, just your sort of overview of, of this, since you've been reviewing the code and, and, and like your level of excitement, your, your commentary. You're not only reviewing, he actually been working on it also. So. But. Well, first, I would like to make a comment that Monty said I edit optimizer trace. I was the code reviewer and I pushed for that feature, but actual coding was done by Varun Gupta. Okay, I missed that. And okay. we can also thank Sergey Krivanos for the assertion you get every time you try to write invalid JSON into the trace. <laughs> yeah. So the original question was... Uh, well, your overall, your 
that was uh -huh. part of your overall commentary, but your overall commentary mm -hmm. about your level of excitement. Of yeah, the well, case. I'm excited that, uh, about the costs, because costs, j previously the costs were like meaningless numbers. So when there was a query plan and you get this cost, which is costs like, well, you know, like several hundred, several thousand, like is this number, it was totally unclear whether this number had any meaning, but it was too high, too low. Okay. Well, it was good enough so that plans could be compared with each other. But now since we get this, uh, <coughs> the cost which has some which can be verified which has some relationship with, or should have at least have some relationship with reality it's going to be much more directed uh, uh, there will be much more uh, we'll be able to reason about the optimize the, the query plan in much better way yeah, so monty i have a question you, you you had this i think it was about six values where you compared the estimated cost with the actual cost and I thought that was really, really close to one. I mean, yeah. uh, and do you expect that to be the, the case in general? Okay, okay. So, it, uh, of course, it depends on the, on, the, on the CPU and everything else. So, this is uh, my des desktop is actually a high end one. So, uh, I do expect that the, the things will not be exact microsecond, but if the pro it will be proportional correct or also in other, both, both laptops and, uh, and higher machines. As long as the proportions is correct, we are fine. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and of course, it also depends on the table size and everything else. So this is the first version, and it's ex more than expected good. Uh, now. It's okay. For, well, tuned queries, uh, like typical LTP workload where every condition matters, that, that we should have a close match. Sometimes you wouldn't have a close match. For example, if you are looking you know, for taking users and then you are interested in only users in Finland and then joining to what orders they have. If you don't, if the optimizer has no clue about which fraction of your users reside in Finland, then it wouldn't, of course, know how much the the, the cost number for table orders would be taken for the everyone in, in in the whole user base, not just in Finland. So in that case, you will in, inevitably see the discrepancy. Uh, but well, uh, this is the case for every optimizer, and you will at least will be able to see like for. For, for well-tuned queries where every condition counts and every condition is used, there, there should be a close match. Sometimes there wouldn't be, so we don't, uh, like, it's not, a tra it's not a catastrophe or something, or a bug if you see mismatch between costs. But, uh, yeah, still, there will be cases where there will be a mismatch. And actually, uh, there were actually one query where that we had, uh, uh, this is, uh, was, is it TCPD that we did run? Where we had one query that was slower. Uh, no, join the order benchmark. Or and then we divide. Before that? Yeah. You mean we were on DB, TC, TCPH? Yeah, TCPH, yes. Yeah. So they, they, they have 10 queries. And, uh, and in one of those, the new optimizer was slower. So we did investigate that. And actually, the cost collisions, cost collisions, calculations based on the information we, we had showed that we were doing the right thing. The, other opti uh, the old optimizer was probably using this 10% rule and happened to choose a better index by chance. But when, then, when we then added um, the new histograms, the new optimizer picked up also the new plan. So it, it can happen but that this is one query in hundreds that I have seen. So sheer luck on the side of the old one. So Vicencio. Okay, so we have some questions from the audience. Now we have the first one from Daniel Black. He's asking how do background linear read ahead affect cost calculations? None. Uh, actually, the read ahead is based on that you get things more in the cache. So basically, if you had also read ahead, you can uh, increase or dec decrease the disk read ratio because that's the calculation of how often do we have to go to disk. So anything related to disk, you have two variables. All right. Uh, there's another question from, also from Daniel. He's asking me to talk about the file sort cost model and what we changed in it. And I can uh, like, give a brief uh, overview in that file sort also had 
a similar rule-based system where it would um, effectively yeah. always steer towards one uh, one approach or the other. Um, but we actually, actually got, went through the code, saw how many uh, comparisons and where it reads and where it writes to temporary files. Uh, added that in addition to how it, it would look if you were to, instead of doing file sort, if you had enough memory, if you were to be able to do merge sort, um, quick sort, sorry, in memory. And after um, adjusting the cost for these, like using just the normal math formula, number of rows times log of number of rows, uh, where you add uh, the initial read and the, the writes you have to do to the temporary files, uh, we actually saw the optimizer produce better results than, uh, better plans than before. The, the costs were actually correct and not what the rule would, prop would give you beforehand. So, yep, it actually went pretty well. Um, other than that, I'm, uh, there's a, a question from uh, Stefan Varocchi. Um, he's asking about analyze table, if it can be scheduled in the background as part of this uh, big optimizer change. I haven't touched uh, the analyze. That's a separate uh, part. And the thing with analyze that most of the, the cost with selectivity, and so you have to run it uh, once or twice on the database. If you you have to have massive changes uh, for it actually to be uh, had to be scheduled again. I would just say that when you if you run it the first time you initialize the database, especially the slave, you run it once, uh, then you should be fine. Because or, it actually can take some time. And uh, we have some ideas of how to make some of the, the statistics uh, uh, much, much faster. And that actually on the census table. Yep. Um, there is some work that um, we have to g give credit for Microsoft. Uh, they have actually done quite some good documentation on, on how they collect statistics. And we're probably going to take some ideas from there. Thank you, Vicencio, and thank you, Monte. Thank you.